Here's what's coming up on this episode of the Summit for Wellness podcast. Each animal is related to the others and related to its own ecology uh, with our management in a way that, that, uses, that uses the plant and the animal as enhancers of the ecology from diversity to wildlife to air, soil, water, all the commons are actually enhanced by this as opposed to depleted by all of this. And that's a that's a pretty um, different different paradigm and certainly a different story spin than the story spin of industrial orthodox agriculture, which is all about wearing out land and then moving to someplace else where the land isn't as worn out. The reason what we do works is because it mimics the migratory choreography of, of animals, of herds and flocks, you know, uh, throughout history uh, in, in the wild. And until we had really dependable, workable electric fence um, that was highly portable and allowed us to, you know, to literally kind of kind of steer steer the animals across the landscape like a like a zero turn mower on a golf course. Until until we had an electric fence. That was almost impossible to do. You know, in the next 15 years, 50% of America's agriculture equity is going to change hands because of the aging farmer. And the question is, well, if 50% of the agriculture equity in our country is going to change hands, whose hands are they going to go into? Is it going to be uh, Monsanto? Or uh, uh, my hope is that it goes into the hands of a new generation of young, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, entrepreneurial, uh, land-caressing uh, caretakers who will steward it into the next, you know, millennium. Until we realize that as we look down on our plate, they envision, you know, sitting down to dinner, you're, I want you to think about looking through your plate into the landscape that that plate is creating. That literally is the truth. And until we as individuals realize that as we look down on the plate that we're eating, it's creating the landscape our children will inherit, we will not be committed enough to do the compelling thing that will make the story and our legacy uh, a, a different trajectory than what we've inherited. Welcome to the Summit for Wellness podcast, where we help you Climb to the peak of your health. And now, here is your host, Brian Carroll. Welcome to episode 14 of the Summit for Wellness podcast. Today, we are going to be talking about sustainable farming, and I've been looking for a little while to find a really good person to interview on this topic because I think it's a fascinating topic, and it's one that we should uh, really be looking into for uh, better farming practices and to provide our communities with better products, and I ended up finding the leader of this movement. And the leader of this movement is Joel Salatin. Some of you may have heard of him before, but he is located out of Virginia. And he has um, one of the largest sustainable farms in America. And he's set up a really just amazing um, operation out there in Virginia. So we'll talk about what that operation looks like and what it has done for his community. And how you can find uh, practices like this in your local communities as well. So our sponsor for this show is your local farmers. And I really mean that. I'm not going to try and have you guys help me out in any way with any other sponsorships. I want you guys to help yourself and your community by going out to your local farmers and helping them to provide you with really good products and good quality meats. And the more we can shift our attention to the farmers in our local areas and for our attention to be on these good processing 
um, practices and these really good quality meats, then the better our food chain will become. And right now, our food chain is making a lot of us sick just by how it's getting processed and all these um, contained facilities that a lot of the animals are coming from, from the commercial um, platform. And so by us going out to the local farmers and showing them with our dollars that we want good quality foods and good quality products, then we can change the way that our food system is. I do want to forewarn you that the audio is a little uh, wonky in this episode, uh, mainly because Joel is a very simple person. And by simple, I mean we weren't able to use my standard system for the way that I record. Um, So I had to scramble last minute to try to figure out how to record from a landline. So we did the best that we could, and I think it still sounds pretty good. And I hope you enjoy it. So let's get to the show. So today we have a special guest for you guys. He is Joel Salatin from uh, Polyface Farms, which is located in Virginia. Uh, Polyface Farms is one of the premier non-industrialized food production farms in America. And he has written over nine books, has been featured in a few different documentaries, such as Food Inc., Farmageddon, and Polyfaces, and he's been a huge advocate of regeneration farming practices. Joel, welcome to the show. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Brian. It's my delight to be with you. Thank you. So, Joel, you have kind of a unique um, story with your farm. Uh, When your family purchased it, Back in, what was it, the 1960s or something, the farm was really worn out, the land was eroded, and it was really abused. How were you guys able to take that type of farmland and turn it around into the production that you guys have going on now? Uh, it's a wonderful question, and I think, I think uh, it speaks directly to the fact that the land is, is biological. You know, one of the, one of the biggest differences between... Um, biological things and mechanical things is that mechanical things don't heal. Uh, you know, if, if a bearing goes out in your front uh, right wheel of your car and goes thump, 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 you don't, you, you, even if you stop and rest it or you even put grease in it or, you know, whatever you want to do, uh, you get in your car, it's still going to go thump, thump, thump. But biology, living things, uh, can heal. And so, uh, when we came, yes, it was, you know, the farm was the armpit of the community, had, you know, uh, uh, big rock, you know, areas, no vegetation. I remember as a child walking the whole farm and never setting foot on a piece of vegetation. It was that, it was that sparse, uh, you know, it just, it just, there was no fertility, uh, weeds and, and, you know, wild strawberries and, and brambles and, and today, um, you know, all those rocks or have a, a foot of soil on them uh, that, that, that grew up slowly, you know, over the years. We didn't haul soil in. It, it, just, it just gradually, you know, grew up over those rocks back with, with additional uh, biomass and vegetation. And, um, and we, we simply looked at nature and said, well, how does nature build soil? And when you start looking at that, you realize, well, it's based on perennials, not annuals. Uh, it, it, it's a complete, consistent ground cover, not tillage. So we, you know, we don't have a plow. We don't do any of that stuff. Um, and and it, it grows. It the, the, the soil grows by the addition of biomass. You know, decomposing organic matter, plant plant material, and manure, and and uh, that sort of thing. And so, um, and so the whole idea was not to use chemical fertilizer, but to appreciate. You know, how can we how can we leverage and metabolize the plants that are on here? How can we um, how can we increase the efficiency of converting solar energy into biomass that can then decompose and build soil? Uh, so this entailed, you know, multi-speciation, um, you know, complex relationships, a combination of different kinds of animals going to perennials, moving them around, incorporating the forest with the open land. So we got a chipper and began large-scale composting, uh, building, and, and we turned compost with pigs, not machinery. So, you know, very, very little machinery, uh, mobile, you know, mobile uh, portable infrastructure and um, and an integrated approach into our community. So instead of trying to export to, you know, foreign countries or whatever, rather, let's look at trying to feed our community first 
and, um, and 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 so developing this this direct you know direct market here in our community um, allowed us to wear those proverbial uh, middleman hat, increase our margin, so we didn't have to get on that treadmill of 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 conquistador um, conquistador dominion over the land, but actually could work with the land and caress it rather than conquistador it, and that that made all the difference. And that kind of leads to that whole sustainable farming and regeneration farming that you've really been preaching with all um, your books and your documentaries that you've done. And it's a lot different process than a lot of these more commercial type farming. So how long did it take before you started noticing that the land and uh, the farm was changing and was starting to regenerate? Yeah, well, you know, uh, it's an interesting question in our case. In our case, it probably took 10 or 12 years because we didn't know much and we didn't have money. And we, we, goodness, in, in the in the very first, I mean, we came in 1961 here. Well, goodness, um, the chainsaw as we know it, which is critical for you know for wood biomass to you know develop chips, chips and sawdust and things like that, uh, had just been you know modernized. Um, uh, the bandsaw mill had not yet been invented. Um, the, you know, uh, uh, materials handling equipment like front end loaders, you know, there, there were no little four wheel drive tractors, no little, you know, uh, um, hydraulics. You know, everything was still, you know, quite primitive. And there, there wasn't even really the, the, the single biggest thing was electric fence. That's that's our that's our stock and trade. I mean, that that's the that's the big thing. And um, and so the, the electric fence um, was very rudimentary at that time. Uh, quite unde- it was not very dependable, and so it made it made control of uh, the livestock real difficult. The reason what we do works is because it mimics the migratory choreography of of animals, of herds and flocks, you know, uh, throughout history uh, in, in the wild, and until we had really dependable, workable electric fence um, that was highly portable and allowed us to, you know, to literally kind of, kind of steer steer the animals across the landscape like a like a zero turn mower on a golf course. Until until we had an electric fence, that was almost impossible to do. The closest was, you know, nomadic cultures and shepherding and and herding animals, but. Um, you know, that was still somewhat rudimentary, you know, to, to keep animals contained and, and that sort of thing. Now, with electric fence, we were able to actually, you know, put a, a, a steering wheel, a brake, and accelerator on that, on that animal and move it where it needed to be for as long as it needed to be for just the right time so that it could prune or manure or... Um, you know, uh, chickens eat, eat flies out of cow pies, you know, just so that they could do, you know, just what needed to be done. Um, you know, part and parcel of this, goodness, was the pneumatic tire. Uh, how could you have, um, you know, portable egg mobiles, you know, mimic the, the egret on the rhino's nose? How could you mimic that on a commercial scale until you could move, um, move large flocks of chickens behind a herd of cows? And so the pneumatic tire enabled us to get a big enough, you know, enabled us the mobility of structures to be able to move large flocks of chickens, you know, distances easily. So there's a, there's a lot of, you know, people look at us and, and I think sometimes wrongly think that we're Luddites and we're, you know, want to go back to, um, you know, washboards, hoop skirts, and harness cooking, and, and nothing could be further from the truth. Um, we're simply using technology to caress the landscape, to to look at those ancient patterns and those order that order, uh, and and how can we how can we massage it, if you will? How can we do that better, as opposed to um, uh, you know a- adulterating or or running roughshod? That's that's a better word. Uh, running roughshod over those those beautiful intricate patterns that we see in nature. So it's kind of interesting that you mentioned that uh, people kind of think that your farm is taking a step back with farming by 
doing the processes that you guys do. However, I would think that because you are using that um, rudimentary pattern with the animals, that you're probably saving money by not having to use as much feed, you're not using fertilizer, you're using, using these processes that are natural for the farm and really utilizing it to the best ability. Yeah, and, and the, the, the coolest thing about that is that it moves our equity. Uh, what we do, of course, takes a tremendous amount of skill and information because you're studying these patterns, these natural patterns, saying how do we do this without pharmaceuticals, without concrete, without you know fans and machinery and all that stuff. And so what it what it does is it moves it moves our our equity from physical infrastructure to non physical. Uh, value, which is skill, information, and customers. And there's not a lending institution or a banker in the world that can come to you and say, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna foreclose on your knowledge, or I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna repossess your skill." And so, by moving from physical to non-physical equity, it not only does it change, you know, our, our capitalization uh, uh, cost, but by changing the capitalization cost, that actually creates a pathway in. For new, new aspiring young farmers, you know, one of the reasons the average American farmer today is 60 years old is because when young people can't get in, old people can't get out. And so, if we can create low capital uh, pathways in, then we will be able to see that 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 successional transfer occur. You know, in the next 15 years, 50 percent of America's agriculture equity is going to change hands because of the aging farmer. And the question is, well, if 50% of the agriculture equity in our country is going to change hands, whose hands are they going to go into? Is it going to be uh, Monsanto? Or um, uh, my hope is that it goes into the hands of a new generation of young, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, entrepreneurial, uh, land-caressing uh, caretakers who will steward it into the next you know, millennium. So we'll go a little bit into um, how you're getting that information out to more farms and more people so that they can take the information and run with a little bit later on. But can you talk about how um, you've set up the farm so that the animals are using the natural resources provided by each other? So how do the chickens use the farmland? How do the cows use the farmland, etc.? Sure, sure. Uh, great, great question. So Let's start with the cows, because cows are, in many kind of radical environmental circles, cows are kind of demonized. But let, let's not talk about cows. Let's start with herbivores. What's the reason for herbivores? If you, if you look around the planet, I mean, there's everything from, you know, zebras to gazelles to caribou to moose to bison to alpacas, llamas. <laughs> there, there are a lot of herbivores around the planet. And the reason that there are so many herbivores is because... Uh, biomass, biomass, um, you know, comes in kind of three styles: trees, uh, bushes or woody species, and then forages, or, or very generically grasses. Just call them forages. And and uh, forages are the are the most efficacious um, converter of solar energy into biomass. But in order, be, but because they are so efficient. They have a very fast metabolism. That means that means they they grow rapidly, they and they mature rapidly, as opposed to a tree, for example, that you know takes years and years and years to mature, grow old, and die. You know what a tree does in a hundred years, a blade of grass does in in uh, you know eighty days. So the reason for the herbivore is to come to that senescent that senescent mature forage and prune it, just like a viticulturalist would prune a vineyard or, a, or an orchardist would prune an apple tree to stimulate new growth. So the herbivore comes to that, that uh, declining forage, prunes it, and what I call um, restarts the biomass accumulation cycle. And, um, and so that's the reason for the herbivore. The, the problem is that in in cattle, uh, with, with cows as an herbivore, we have divorced the herbivore from that historic role. 
and we put them in feed lots. We we've, we've given them uh, annuals like corn and soybeans instead of perennials like grass and clover. And uh, so we, we have we have taken what is a very beautiful symbiotic, um, refreshing, encouraging, stimulating uh, relationship, and we have profoundly um, taken a beautiful integration and created an ugly segregation out of it. And and so on our farm, we're looking at how herbivores move and this pruning. How does this happen? in nature with these migratory, um, you know, herds and stuff. Well, you know, we can't migrate anymore because the neighbor doesn't want our cows. And, you know, it's not good to run a herd of uh, a million bison probably through the parking lot of Starbucks. So, you know, that's kind of problematic today. But what we can do is with, with high-tech electric fencing, we can literally steer those pruners around the landscape as precisely and perfectly as you can wield a set of pruning shears in a vineyard or a, a zero turn mower on a, on a golf course. And, and for the first time in human history, that's possible. Uh, so that's, that's how the, the animals then move around our farm. And the result is that, that we quintuple, not quadruple, not triple, but quintuple the amount of production per acre on our farm compared to uh, other people. Obviously, if we're quintupling production, we're quintupling carbon sequestration, uh, solar collection, biomass generation. And so since 1961, our farm has gone from 1% organic matter to over 8% organic matter due to this increased vegetative, uh, vegetative production because of the strategic pruning. Now, if you're going to move these cows around, you know, they need, they need shade. We have portable shade mobiles using high-tech spun uh, uh, woven uh, nursery shade cloth on, on portable, you know, portable uh, infrastructure. We follow the cows in with the egg mobile. The egg mobiles come behind them. The chickens, you know, the birds follow the herbivores in nature. The chickens then scratch through the cow patties, spread them out, eat the fly larvae out, sanitize the paddock, convert the worms and the grasshoppers and crickets into eggs. And that way we get, we get uh, eggs as a byproduct of the pasture sanitation program. Um, when we feed hay, we do so in a, in a simple uh, shed shelter to protect all the manure and urine from the winter, you know, snow and rain and all that. And we use wood chips or carbon, uh, you know, any other carbon, uh, you know, old hay, old corn stalks, uh, peanut hulls, uh, bark mulch, uh, you know, name your, name your carbon, but um, we have a carbonaceous diaper, if you will, under all that manure and urine to absorb it, to hold it. The cows are tromping out the uh, oxygen, so it's actually anaerobic, fermenting. We add corn to it. When the cows come out and begin grazing again in the spring, then we go into that three to four foot deep bedding pack with, that's fermented with all this corn in it, put pigs in there. Pigs then seek the corn. And in doing so, they aerate it, oxygenate it, kind of go through like a great big egg beater and stir it all up. That moves it from anaerobic to aerobic compost with the pigs doing all the work. So then the heart and soul of the farm is this whole composting thing where we're putting hay through the, 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 the herbivore. The, uh, the herbivore um, transforms it into manure and urine, which is absorbed by a carbonaceous diaper, which is composted by the pigs goes back on the land to, to, to feed the actinomycetes and the mycelium and the earthworms to grow to, to be to, for the soil to be more effective at metabolizing solar energy into biomass, which is then cut for hay, and, and you know, the whole cycle just goes over and over and over. So whereas, you know, most people think of a farm as kind of a, a land a land degenerative thing, we see a proper farm as a land regenerative thing. And that's a really cool, hopeful thing to be able to look to realize we can actually build soil in farming with commercial production, not uh, not deplete the commons. That's pretty cool. That is actually really neat, especially considering a lot of the farmlands, like you mentioned, they're only set aside for whether it's cows or they might be chicken farms or something. But you're using 
all of those main animals on the same land, and all of them are contributing to the regeneration of that said farm. Yeah, so each animal so each animal is related to the others and related to its own ecology uh, with our management in a way that, that uses that uses the plants and the animals as enhancers of the ecology from diversity to wildlife to air, soil, water, all the commons are actually enhanced by this as opposed to depleted by all of this. And that's a that's a pretty um, different different paradigm and certainly a different story spin than the story spin of industrial orthodox agriculture, which is all about wearing out land and then moving to someplace else where the land isn't as worn out. That's been the story of civilization kind of throughout history. Very few places have been able to actually um, to actually uh, uh, mimic these patterns uh, in such a sophisticated way as to be able to um, regenerate long term, even with commercial uh, commercial production. And this type of process has allowed you to uh, really support your community too, because you service more than five thousand families, fifty restaurants, ten retail outlets, and the farmers markets. Um, can you talk about how you can take this type of farming and bring it down to a smaller scale? Yeah, well, that's that's a favorite thing now. You know, it's the, the tension of my life is that thirty years ago when people started asking me to tell my story, you know, and I do a speech and I get done and and uh, they'd say, oh, that's that's cute and warm and fuzzy, but how does it scale up? Today I get done and people sit there and say, wow, that's amazing. How does it scale down? <laughs> you know, that's that's just the way things go. But one of the beauties of, of this whole uh, approach, that this, um, this kind of mobile, modular, management-intensive approach that I've described, is that the infrastructure is very cheap and very scalable. Again, the equity is in the management, the mobility, and the, and the modular uh, uh, configuration of the infrastructure. So you can start very small. I mean, let me give you an uh, uh, example. My first Eggmobile, I built on bicycle wheels. It was six feet by eight feet, a little squatty, um, you know, uh, a wire mesh floor with a little uh, uh, top peak roof, you know, house on, house on top that weighed so light I had, it was on two bicycle wheels, and I could push it around. It had about 48 chickens uh, in it, or, or 45, something like that, and I could literally just push it around by hand and had a yard that went out from it. It was really, really slick. And so, you know, that same kind of thing can be done uh, today. What happened was I happened to move at one time after the cows had been by and saw them you know, scratching up the cow pies. So aggressively, I said, whoa, wait a minute, uh, this is pretty cool. Look what these chickens are doing. So then I, I retrofitted it to a, to a three-point hit so I could pick it up with a tractor. Uh, and then that worked so well. Then I said, well, let's make a, make a trailer. So then we made the pneumatic tire, you know, Eggmobile. And now we put hook two of them together like a train. And we move, you know, 800 chickens at a time in these two um, Eggmobiles. So that's the progression. Um, so one of the one of the beauties of this is that it, 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 it's not about it, it, it's not prejudicial toward volume. Um, it's prejudi- it's prejudicial toward management and observation. And um, and so this can be done in a suburban backyard. Uh, it can be done anywhere. Now you know I'm a big fan of even chickens in your house. I mean, if you don't have any land at all. Um, you know, throw out the dog, the cat, the parakeet, and the boa constrictor and put in a couple of chickens. And you can feed them kitchen scraps. And uh, now that eliminates, um, you know, garbage to the landfill. And you get a couple eggs. And, um, you know, if, 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 if this became normative in the culture, we wouldn't even have an egg, quote-unquote, an egg industry. You know, uh, it would be people just um, producing their own eggs from, um, you know, from the waste stream. And historically, that's how chickens were used. You know, that's why chickens in the homestead 
you know, the farmstead, homestead kind of went together was because chickens were a salvage, salvage operation for, you know, spoiled fruits, um, you know, the edges, uh, you know, bugs, ticks, crickets, things like that. And um, so, there's, you know, there's a lot of benefit there. And when you, when you take uh, birds away from that, uh, from that niche of, of beneficialness, I don't know if that's a word or not, but you know It is I mean? now. Uh, from, from, that, from that beneficial ministry, if you will, that, that niche that respects, that respects their, um, what, their unique physiology and, and phenotypical uh, design, then, you know, then they're not nearly as efficient as they would be fulfilling their, you know, their functionality. Yeah, and chickens are pretty easy to raise. I have a bunch of chickens at my house, and I give them all my scraps and let them roam around the yard. And not only is the quality of the eggs a lot better than what you can find in the store, but a lot of my friends and stuff will come over and ask if I have any extra eggs so that they can use them too. So uh, like you said, even if you had a couple chickens and you were able to get the eggs from them, that can be your start to providing for yourself or your family with good quality foods. Yeah, yeah, that, that's for sure. And and you know, I, I think I think it, it doesn't hurt to even mention kind of the, the spiritual or emotional uh, dimension of this. That that um, you know, we fear what we don't know, and I mean, all of us are like that. If I don't know anything about it, then I'm kind of timid and fearful about it. And I think that actually participating in the in the mystery, the awesomeness of of gardening and food production and animals and life like this, your, your own. I mean, there's nothing as intimate that we do than than eating, right? Than, than eating food, feeding our our three trillion member internal community, our microbiome. Uh, it, it, that's a pretty intimate uh, personal thing that we do and to be as profoundly ignorant of, of that whole thing as most people are um, is to actually fear what nurtures us and when you fear what nurtures you um, it, 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 it's simply not a healthy emotional mental place to be because you see you, know, you see demons everywhere and you're paranoid you don't trust and and there's all sorts of ramifications, societal, big societal ramifications when you fear something that's supposed to be as intimately nourishing as food. And so, um, and so I think that backyard gardening, I mean, even patio gardening, uh, rooftop gardening, uh, having honeybees up there or, uh, you know, tubular gardens that hang on your, your porch, you know, you pack them in compost and you grow all your herbs and strawberries in these little pocketed uh, uh, tubes um, having a couple of chickens in the in the house or rabbits in the in, in the out by the garage um, participating in this whole in, in, participating in food in some tactile visceral way I think has ramifications way beyond just you know physical security and uh, and, and uh, you know doing it for yourself and I appreciate DIY, I get to do it yourself, you know, that's great. But I think I think there's a lot more to it than just that. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Okay, so you probably have some of the best foods um, that anybody can get from a farmer because of the way that you have set up your farming. However, you're a really big proponent on staying local and providing for your communities. So you don't ship anywhere to the U.S., right? It's more just the local region. Yeah, the the only the only thing the only food we ship right now are our um, is our pork jerky. They're called Rome sticks, and um, and we ship those uh, because they're they, they're they're shelf stable. There's no spoilage. They can go in a little jiffy mailer, and in fact, um, that is what historically what how people used to travel. You know, think about. Think about uh, 100, 200, 200 years ago when somebody, or good, go, go back, go, you know, 800 years ago when somebody traveled, um, you know, there wasn't a, there wasn't a, a, a McDonald's or a Burger King, not that I'm encouraging anybody to go there, but uh, there, there wasn't the options to um, stop and dine anywhere like we have today, uh, especially in the wilderness. 
And so, uh, you know, the Native Americans and things. So how did they, how did they travel? How did they send, you know, a delegation, a week's journey over to, you know, the, the League of, the League of Indian Nations? You know, how did they do that? Well, they traveled with, with, um, jerky, with, um, dehydrated meat. This was, you know, this was the, the, the nutrient dense thing that they didn't, they didn't dangle watermelons from squash as much as I like watermelons from squash. That wasn't dangling from their belt, you know. That what was dangling was was a pouch of pemmican or, um, uh, you know, a jerky dried, you know, dried meat and stuff. And so, um, so yeah, we we do ship the uh, you know the the, rump, the, the pork uh, jerky and it it's to die for. But no, we don't ship anything else. Uh, we stay kind of in our what we call our bio region. We we go out four hours. Um, and four hours, and this is not, you know, a thing of, of, of cultishness to us, but we feel like four hours is what uh, anyone who, like a driver that's driving for us, uh, they don't have to spend the night. They can get out and get back in a day. And any customer who's buying uh, can, can get here to the farm, see it, and get home in a day. So the kind of the four hours, a little bit of an arbitrary circle that we've drawn out there, and, and that's what we try to support. For all of us that can't get your products, how do you um, how do you inspire us to go out to our local farmers to get the our meats and our produce from the local farmers, and how to get these farmers to start um, thinking about the different types of quality of meat and products that they provide, and to start looking more into the sustainable type farming? Yeah, well, uh, thank you for the question. It's yeah, you know, there there are certainly uh, places where it's easier or harder to find our kind of food, but I can tell you it's becoming more and more and more common, way more common today than 20 years ago. So that's that's a very hopeful trajectory. And um, so what I tell people is, I was inspired one time. I'll tell you a story just to help you appreciate uh, where I'm coming from. I was up in um, Ontario doing a, a a presentation at Guelph, at the University of Guelph in Ontario. And there were three of us uh, doing these presentations, and one of them was an attorney from Toronto. And let me tell you her story. So uh, she and her husband, you know, lived in a, like a six-floor, um, you know, uh, condominium up in this high-rise in Toronto. And um, they had a baby. She had a baby. He didn't. She had and this baby kind of, you know, whoa, we're responsible for this life, and it kind of got them to thinking. And so, well, you know, what what can we do to ensure that this is a healthy, you know, uh, baby? So, you know, the first thing they decided to do was breastfeed. Well, that, that was one thing they could do. Okay, so they did that. So, well, what about, you know, everything else? And so they decided to unplug the... Uh, uh, TV, basically, they said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take all of our time and money that we would spend on entertainment and recreation for one year, just one year, like take a one-year sabbatical from your typical entertainment recreation, and we're going to spend that time and money seeking our, our food sources. Uh, they're, they're here, we just have to find them with the idea being that at the end of the year, there are no barcodes in our pantry. This, is, this story is, you know, it's about 12 years old, so, you know, it, it, it probably would be a lot harder to do today, the, the no barcode thing. But anyway, enjoy, the, appreciate where she's coming from. And, and so she's telling these college students at the University of Guelph, so she said, my husband and I did it, and we found our grains, we found our meats, we found our eggs, we found our produce, we found everything. And she said, at the end of the year, we looked at the pantry, and there were no barcodes. Now, you can say that's extreme, whatever you want to, but the, for me, it was a very convicting challenge saying, man, if, a, if, a, 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 if an upscale, um, high, you know, I mean, she's a high-powered attorney, you know she's putting in a lot of hours a week, they're just a professional couple. They've got demanding jobs. They live in a, a condominium up on the sixth floor of a of an apartment complex. 
if they can do that, then what's my excuse for even coming halfway? And so this is still my challenge. I, I tell folks, you know, if you want to, if you want to do this, you can't expect it to happen without you doing anything different. Uh, what's the, the the definition of insanity? Is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. And so if we're going to change the food culture, if we're going to change Tyson, Monsanto, if we're going to change, you know, the obesity epidemic, type 2 diabetes, the, the chronic, you know, non-infectious disease uh, killers that we that we lead the world in in our, in our country, the, the dead zone the size of New Jersey and the Gulf of Mexico, all, I mean, list your, you know, <laughs> make, your, make your hate list. Man, I hate that we do this, 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 this. All right. Well, the way to change that is to change the way we eat. And while you can say, well, what in the world could one person do? Well, the thing is, all great movements start with the power of one. And where we are today is the, uh, is the physical manifestation of trillions and trillions of little individual decisions. You know, do I, do I uh, get a crock pot and throw supper in a crock pot, or do I get, you know, takeout with MSG in it? Uh, whatever, uh, but 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 what we the the food farm ecology landscape that our culture has created did not happen because nobody did anything. It happened because people did things. A lot of them were the wrong thing, and so you can't you can't do an about face. You can't do a redemptive uh, remediation system without fundamentally changing the way things are right now. And that includes me as an individual. It includes you as an individual. Looking in the mirror and saying, okay, I get it, so what am I going to do tomorrow? It really is that simple. And that's why on all of our uh, cooler bags, our little moniker is healing the land one bite at a time. Until we realize that as we look down on our plate, they envision, you know, sitting down to dinner. You're, I want you to think about looking through your plate into the landscape that that plate is creating. That literally is, is the truth. And until we as individuals realize that as we look down on the plate that we're eating, it's creating the landscape our children will inherit. We will not be committed enough to do the compelling thing that will make the story and our legacy uh, a, a different trajectory than what we've inherited. That's so great. There's so much passion behind that statement that you that you just said. I love it. Can you talk about um, uh, how these foods impact our health why is it more important for me to eat food from a farm like yours than it is if i go to the store and, and just get some from the store sure well the, the um you know the nutrient uh, the nutrient balance and the nutrient density in food changes uh dramatically based on how that food is produced so you know i'll give you an example uh mother earth news magazine um commissioned 12 of us, uh, goodness, eight or nine years ago, uh, in the country, they wanted to they wanted to debunk this idea that the industry says, oh, come on, an egg is an egg is an egg, uh, a tomato is a tomato is a tomato, and, uh, and, and you know, that doesn't make any difference to how it's produced. So they wanted to debunk this, so they, they contacted 12 of us, pastured poultry producers in the country, and said, would you be willing to send your eggs to a test? Um, to do a nutrient analysis on, I don't know what, uh, 10 or 12 um, uh, nutrients. And, um, and so we can compare it to the USDA uh, label. There's a, you know, there's a generic USDA label that anybody can use and slap on a dozen eggs. It's, it's, a, nutrient, it's a nutrient label. But sure. So, you know, we sent some eggs to, this, to a lab, to this uh, food science lab. The results came back. Um, and... They're in, they're in the Mother Earth News archives. They're also, I've, I've repeated our personal ones in my book, Folks, This Ain't Normal, so you can see them all. I'll just give you one. Um, folic acid, which is a really critical um, uh, fatty acid for uh, 
for uh, pregnant women especially. And um, in the official USDA normal, you know, food uh, egg label, I think there's 48 uh, micrograms. It'll say micrograms per egg. Um, in our eggs, there were 1,038 micrograms per egg. Wow. Um, so, so you know, this isn't this isn't just a little 10 percent deviation. <laughs> this is huge. You know? And and grass finished beef. I mean, the 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 nutrient changes like riboflavin typically is 300 percent higher in grass finished beef. Than grain, uh, than grain finished beef, and and well, what's the importance of riboflavin? Well, riboflavin is the calming uh, nutrient. It's what it's what keeps you from flying off the handle. So you wonder about you know road rage and people shooting people and, and all the domestic violence and things that are going on in our in our in our culture as we unravel. Well, maybe some of it is because we're not getting the riboflavin that our ancestors got that you know that made them a little less. Um, uh, volatile, um, and, and so you know, conjugated linoleic acid, omega three, omega six ratios, you know, all these things. There are there are major differences. Um, there have been numerous studies. Again, I put these in the folks this folks this ain't normal book um, on, on vegetables and um, and and produce, and you know, just enough to, to tweak people's understanding. But this notion that you know, a lettuce is a lettuce is a lettuce is, is simply uh, not true. And if you, you know, if you've ever eaten, for example, a tomato, I realize that's not a vegetable, that's actually a fruit, but anyway, uh, the, the, the difference between a tomato that you get out of a backyard garden grown in a compost, and, you know, that's juicy and, 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 you, and it runs clear down your elbow as you bite into it, versus those cardboard tomatoes at the supermarket that are made to be gassed in route, picked green, and handled 1,500 miles of bouncing around on the back of a truck, there's there's no comparison in the taste, quality, texture, and nutrition of those two of those two items. So um, the question is, which one which one really uh, feeds? my internal microbiome. There again, I mean, I talked about looking through our plate. I think we also need to look down at our belly and realize that there's this three trillion member community in there. And I, of course, I, you know, for fun, I say, yeah, they're probably going to school and having podcasts and conferences and, you know, (laughs) (laughs) building interstates and what the point is that there's this, this massive community of beings. Stanford University has now uh, isolated their language. We can't communicate with them yet, but but we know that they talk to each other and say, "Hey, hey, there's you know there's some protein over here. Come over here, you know the little the little uh, microbes run over there and grab that protein. Oh, hey, there's some calcium over here. Anybody need calcium? Okay, come you know. And so, so the, it, it, it's like this this whole cafe community, you know, of, of trading and bartering and and going on down there. And, and I think when we when we view our, our insides as the kind of life that they really are, it, it, it moves us to a place of, of responsible thinking, of, of, of caring. Uh, Michael Pollan, I think, is, is so good on this. He, he, says, he says, I think most people eat thoughtlessly. And I think he's right. We just eat. It, it's, it's just something we do because, well, I got to eat. You know, I'm hungry, whatever. My stomach's rumbling. Um, but we, we actually eat fairly thoughtlessly. We eat with convenience. We eat with you know, whatever's at hand, um, whatever's being advertised on TV, whatever our friends are eating. You know, this, this kind of thoughtless, just, just go with the flow. And, and I think that, that if we actually saw the, the incredible complexity and in, intricacy of this, this, this relational living being oriented community inside of us, we suddenly we kind of hey 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 guys hey guys um, uh, can I help you here today you know I want to help you not hurt you I want to I, I want to be your friend not your enemy and um, and and I, I think that's a that's a you know, it's humorous but I think I'm dead serious that I think that's a real uh, helpful way to 
move us mentally into a space where we're willing to uh, to invest to invest the thought process in how are we going to feed this community. Yeah, and to go back to the point about people um, eating thoughtlessly, we're seeing a lot now that people don't even know when they're eating. They'll be watching TV and they'll just have something next to them, and next thing they know, the bowl of whatever it is is gone, and it's just instinct now to grab whatever's around you and eat it. So it's it's kind of scary. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, it, 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 it's more just um, kind of spontaneous... Uh, um, uh, spontaneous grazing than actual uh, uh, thinking about stuff. You know, Americans. Amer- uh, there's there's so many interesting you know food studies and, and I mean the the depth and breadth of, of market research now is just incredible to where the, the numbers are amazing. Like like 25 percent of all food in America is now consumed in an automobile. That's just an amazing wow. statistic. Uh, the average American spends less than uh, 11 minutes a day in their kitchen. Um, uh, 80% of Americans have no idea at 4 o'clock what they're going to eat for supper. Uh, 80%. Um, 70% of all uh, menus, 70% of all menus are chosen by people under 10 years old. It's a <laughs> so your kids are course, deciding what you eat. <laughs> People under 10 years, I mean, when you say, I, I purposely say people under 10 just to help people do the mental gymnastics. People, people <laughs> uh, that's children. Yeah, yeah, you got you right, right, that's children. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're deciding what, you know, what we eat. So all the, you know, comfort food, I mean, boy, even if you have a, you know, a, a, a farm to fork restaurant, I mean, you almost have to have mac and cheese or nobody will come with their kids. <laughs> Chicken nuggets. Right. Corn dogs. Right. Yeah. You know, the main right. staples. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you, you can't be too weird. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so, yeah, so this is, this is the new, you know, this is the new state of affairs. And, uh, and this is a new normal, which is, of course, why I wrote the book, folks, this ain't normal. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's not normal. All right, we're getting close to the end of time. There was one thing you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned grass finished and grain finished, and I think that would be a really important piece for people to know the difference. Could you briefly touch that? Sure. Well, many people have you know have heard the phrase grass fed and all that. Well, um, most beef in America is now grain finished in a in a feedlot, um, which means it's you know corn, soybean, barley. It's it's it, it, fattened on a high carbohydrate perennial. Now, it sure makes it fat, which makes it moist, um, but it also chases a lot of the nutrition out of the body and and uh, uh, makes the, the, uh, the bad fats go up, the good fats go down, and changes the nutrient profile, I mean, dramatically. And so when we say grass finished, we mean an animal, we mean a, a, an herbivore, an herbivore that's never had grain, that, that's never, uh, it, it, it's, not, it's not grain finished on pasture, it is grass exclusive, exclusive grass finished. You know, for our place, you know, we've, we've coined the term salad bar beef to help explain this. This is salad bar beef. They're moved every day to a new salad bar. The salad bar is diversified. It's not a monocrop or a monoculture. A lot of diversity in the pasture. And, and, uh, and the, the, the profile, the, the profile of the two items uh, is, is quite dramatically different. And so that's the difference between grass finished and, you know, and grain fed. And I want to talk briefly on um, the fish uh, culture as well. I know you don't do fish, but there. Since we've been talking about uh, the animals eating what they're supposed to naturally be eating, there is a difference between wild caught fish and farmed fish. And farmed fish typically are fed corn and soy products. Which I don't know if you've ever seen corn or soy growing under the water, but I definitely haven't. And so that's going to change the the type of food that you're eating if you're getting farm fish. So if you're looking for good quality fish as well, make sure you get the wild caught 
type of fish. Yes, absolutely. There's there's a lot of difference there. Uh, even the texture, the taste, the color, all of those things. And these these uh, these fish feedlots now, these fish feedlots like down in uh, Peru and and off of uh, coast of South America, they're 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 again creating these big toxic dead zones in the sea. Uh, they're having to uh, again give the fish uh, antibiotics to keep them alive in such a pathogen-inducing environment because they're too crowded and and the, the ocean can't can't clean through fast enough. Yeah, it's just oh my goodness, it it, it, it doesn't end. You know, our our capacity our capacity to louse things up um, seems to be bottomless and endless and. Uh, you know what? What I'd like to see is is our capacity to uh, to heal, uh, be endless. That would be that would be a wonderful thing. That's because we keep trying to play God. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's right. It's not and, and, and we don't and we don't respect we don't respect that things are the way they are for a reason. I mean, there's a reason why a mouse is the size of a mouse is, and an elephant is the size of an elephant. An elephant the size of a mouse wouldn't be a very successful elephant, and a mouse the size of an elephant wouldn't be a very successful mouse. There are there are reasons. There there's an order. Um, there, there's a reason why things are the way they are, and so rather than just walking in like a swashbuckling you know sailor and, and saying, well, order doesn't matter, and uh, whatever I can do, I can do, like the, on Jurassic Park, you know, uh, when the when the out of control. Um, Raptors are destroying civilization as we know it. And the scientist is euphoric, and the journalist gets in his face and says, "But sir, just because we can, should we?" That's a pregnant question, and one that's worth asking. Because the truth is, our culture worships at the altar of technicians. Uh, technicians rule the roost, and technicians ask how. Poets and prophets ask why. And a culture that, that worships at technicians will fast innovate things that it can't spiritually, morally, physically, or emotionally metabolize. And what happens is we overrun our metabolism headlights with innovation and then spend the next two, three, four generations trying to fix what our technical innovation did because it refused to go to the prophets and the poets and ask, should we? That is powerful. So you have done a documentary all about your farm. Polyfaces is the name of that documentary, correct? Yeah. Do you have any other uh, documentaries that you would like people to take a look at um, if they are interested in more of the sustainable type farming? Or what about your books? Well, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's a loaded question. Can you imagine an, 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 an author not saying, uh, buy my book? Um, so I, I, I've written 10, and the 11th one is coming out here in another month. And my first um, children's book is coming out in the next two weeks. Um, and I've done that with my daughter, who's my little artist. And uh, my little artist, she's 30. But anyway, um, and she's my artistic gal and she's illustrated it and um and so it's our first children's book so we're very very excited about this children's book coming out uh, all of these are available on amazon or uh through chelsea green distribution or our own uh, polyface farm so if you want to know more about what we do come on a farm tour we do scheduled farm tours throughout i speak a lot i travel a lot uh, if you want to see where i am the schedule is on there the website is Polyface Farms, P-O-L-Y-F-A-C-E Farms, F-A-R-M-S, uh, and there's a lot of information there, and I just encourage people to go there. They can, they can, uh, they can get their belly full as much as they <laughs> as much as they want on the website. What's the name of the book coming out? The one coming, uh, the the adult book. Uh, that sounds funny, doesn't the adult, <laughs> yes, it? Does. I mean, it's, <laughs> the, the regular book is uh, Your Successful Farm Business, Production, Profit, and Pleasure. The children's book is Patrick Pigeon's Great Grass Adventure with Greg the Grass Farmer. 
Awesome. And all of that can be found at polyfacefarms.com. Another thing I wanted to quickly mention is just how transparent your farm is, which is uh, much different than most of the commercial feedlots, and that people can come to your farm and take tours. People can, I think they can take video and shoot photos yeah. anywhere, right? Yes, yes. We're 24-7, 365 open door policy anyone can come from anywhere anytime to see anything unannounced that's our level of transparency and um, uh, not that we're never embarrassed but it does keep us on our toes and i think if every every farm had that kind of policy uh we would probably fundamentally change our food system in this country i agree is there anywhere else that people can find you online? Are you on any social media channels or? Well, I mean, the, no, not me personally. I'm, uh, I just, I don't have time for that stuff. But, uh, I mean, the, the farm, you know, we have, we have uh, uh, Facebook, you know, Facebook page um, that, that my staff keeps up and uh, an Instagram uh, page that we keep up. Uh, that's about all I can think of right now. Uh, but that's probably enough. And again, you know, you just start start looking looking for you know you can do Polyface or my name, and this stuff will this stuff will pop up when you're when you're savvy. Uh, I'm not very savvy on that stuff. I still use you know telephone and and uh, and just emails about as far as I've gotten on a computer. So uh, so uh, you know pe- people that are people that are that know how to manipulate all that stuff can certainly find out more pretty easily and we'll put links to all of that on the show notes too so people can find it that way thank you joel so much for coming onto the show i really appreciate you taking the time out of your day um to get away from the farm a little bit and to talk with all of us about sustainable farming thank you brian it's been a delight and an honor and you're a you're a great um you're a great interviewer you ask these pregnant questions and then just uh, uh wait for them to get answered which is Very cool. So thank you. It's an honor to be with you and and your audience. Thank you, Joel. Okay, if you like this episode of the Summit for Wellness podcast, then please go to whatever podcast app that you are using and subscribe to the channel. Um, And if you are on iTunes, please go ahead and leave us a review and rating. They do help out the show, and that way other people can find the show as well. And we will see everybody next time.